um, public event of this calendar year for the centre. So as you don't know me, I'm Paul Quinn. I'm the director of the Chichester Centre for Fairy Tale fantasy and speculative fiction. Um, the other voice that you heard is is Heather, who keeps everything running, particularly when I have a breakdown and she has to take over things. And so she's running the scheme, uh, the screens tonight. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker this evening, um, Anne E. Duggan, who, along with some of our other illustrious guests on the call, is one of the key figures in fairy tale studies. Um, Anne is Professor of French and Fairy Tale Studies at Wayne State University of Michigan. She's an author, editor, and translator of many books, including uh, 2001's A Cultural History of the, 2021 rather, A Cultural History of the Fairy Tales. And tonight's talk is The Lost Princess, which I think is the book out already, Anne, or is it due out? It is, it is out. So. Have you got uh, copies to sell at the end? <laughs> I do have, uh, did I put it in the beginning or the end? So I do have a discount code and it's um, a good a good deal. So <laughs> excellent. And this this so will be a great publicity yeah. for it. And um, so without further ado, um, let's hand over to Anne for The Lost Princess, Women Writers and the History of Classic Fairy Tales. Thank you, Anne. All right. Thank you so much. And you can see the PowerPoint, yes. Um, so I want to first thank the Chichester Center and especially Heather Robbins and Paul Quinn for hosting me today and giving me the chance to share my work on the amer amazing legacy of women fairy tale writers of times past. I want to begin this talk with the first paragraph of my book in order to get us thinking about what it would be like to encounter fairy tales in earlier pre-Disney historical periods. <clears throat> so this is the first paragraph. Through this book, I would like to take the reader on a voyage into a fairy tale land, a once upon a time when the tales we now consider classic were born. In this universe, no one has yet heard of Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, Hans Christian Andersen, or Walt Disney. Although it's a universe that includes Charles Perrault, whose tales were the main sources for Disney's Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty, his tales do not dominate the cultural landscape to the degree to which they do today. It's a time when other Cinderella tales with strong heroines such as Finette Cinder's are just as popular as the one with which 21st century readers and film goers are familiar. It's a world in which the virtuous heroine from Finette or the Clever Princess kills her persecutor, an era when Amazonian women had princely sons, as in an early version of Beauty and the Beast, a period when a female white cat was at least as well known as Perot's male Puss in Boots. This universe is not that of Rapunzel, but of Percinet, a tale used to criticize arranged marriages. And it is a time of popular maiden warrior tales with, with such cross-dressing, swashbuckling heroines as Constantine from The Wild Man. Let's see. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Here we go. And it, um, these tales were all written by, oh, let's see. I think I'm, I'm not totally used to um, teams. So here we, here's the last line. <laughs> um, these tales were all written by a unique group of women, Marie-Catherine Donnois, Marie-Jeanne Héritier, Gabrielle Suzanne de Villeneuve, Charlotte Rose de la Force, and Henriette Julie de Murat. And today I'm going to outline this voyage in ways that I hope will challenge 21st century assumptions about fairy tales and the roles that women writers played in the development and evolution of the genre and also the place of fairy tale heroines. So I'm going to go through, kind of give a brief um, uh, idea of each of the chapters. So the first chapter revolves around Donois' Cinderella tale called Finette Cendron or Finette Cinders. And I go through the history. So each of the chapters sort of follow what, what made the tales and then where did they go by women writers. So I start with the cat Cinderella, which we could say is the first recognizable European version of Cinderella. And um, Zazola, I love teaching this because the heroine kills her stepmother and manages to marry a king. So she's far from passive. Um, Perot's Cinderella, he knew Basile's version, and I think that's important because we have this discourse that, <clears throat> you know, fairy tales didn't, 
they just came from folk culture. But actually, a lot of the French fairy tales um, are based on Italian tales. And so when Perrault modifies Cinderella, he's doing it very consciously. Uh, so I think that's important. And he reduces the agency of the heroine significantly. Um, L'Héritier, so Donois is going to borrow from Basile Perrault and L'Héritier to write her Cinderella tale. And L'Héritier's Finette, or The Clever Princess, isn't exactly a Cinderella tale, but Donois is going to name her heroine after L'Héritier's heroine. And in the tale, Finette outsmarts Richcraft, the man who seduces her two sisters and gets them pregnant. Um, she nearly kills him once when Richcraft wanted to take his, and then, so she nearly kills him once, and then Richcraft wants to take his revenge on Finette and wants to push her in a blade-ridden bar barrel, and instead she pushes him in the barrel, and he ends up dying from his injuries. So we have, like, two of these three stories have heroines who kill and are virtuous. Um, and I do a lot with the legacies of the tales, because I think that's important. We we also kind of have this almost assumption that the women writers of the 1690s in France had no legacies, and uh, and they did. And the tales, the the spunkiness, the agency of the heroines often did not disappear. So this is an 1890s department store illustration of L'Héritier's Finette, um, and you can see on the right hand image it's. And if you want to hear more about those, I can talk about it later, um, but Here's Richcraft going in to seduce the sisters. On the left is her first attack where she sets up a bed over a sewer. He falls down as an injured. And then on the right is when she actually manages to kill him by throwing him in the barrel and he dies. Um, so those are all influences for Donois, Finette, Cendron, or Finette Cinders. And um, in order to grant her heroin more agency than Perrault's Cinderella, because I argue she's playing on his tale. She also combines, like the first half of her tale, she's playing on Petit Pousse or Little Thumbling, where the children are abandoned in the forest, and then splices it together with a Cinderella tale. Um, she also draws from Basile and Nerite with an enterprising and murderous heroine. Finette pushes an ogre into the oven, which very likely may have influenced Grimm's Hansel and Gretel, kills him, and then she decapitates the ogress while doing her hair in order to escape. So there's the ogre scene. Um, in the Cinderella part, uh, what I think is really interesting about Donois' tale is Sandron, who's the name, or Cinders, um, is her name in the second half of the tale. She attends many balls. She only runs home before her sisters get back so they don't beat her up afterwards. Um, and she doesn't go to meet a prince. She's going to have a good time. Um, she gets the attention of all the men. Uh, all the women are jealous of her, but uh, you know she's not there to get married. And then when she runs away from the ball, she loses her shoe in the forest and the prince who's never seen her, or we don't know that, he, he's never seen her as far as we know. He falls in love with her shoe, falls deathly ill and wants to marry the woman whose, whose foot fits in the shoe. Um, Finette later, when she hears this, she jumps on her horse and splashes mud on her sisters as she rides to claim her shoe and marry the prince. Um, so she doesn't wait for the prince or anything. Um, she kind of punishes her sisters with the mud. Uh, and, and one of the things I want to emphasize is that this tale didn't just disappear after she published it in 1697. So this is, um, and I, I'm just going to give you the big story, but basically Donois' Finette Cendron is an example of the folklorization of a literary tale. So Donois t wrote the tale, it spread throughout France through chapbooks, through the Bibliothèque Bleu. Um, there was an oral version in Poitou collected um, my colleague Charlotte Tranquedulis has a great article on one of the versions that made it to Missouri in the U.S. And you can see in the chart sometimes the social status of the parents changed, the heroines. Um, the tale also made its way to Germany, and the tiny ears in the middle column is from Ludwig von Hochshausen, who gave this tale to the Grimm's. They did not include it in the Kinder von uh, Hausmärchen. Uh, but they kept a tale in manuscript form. 
um, from Germany. It, it entered into German oral culture. There's a version I found collected by Klecti. Um, and then it made it into Czech, Czechoslovakia, well, Czech Republic. We'll call it Czech Republic for the sake of simplicity. Um, and there were oral versions that were circulating and Bozema Nemkova, who people refer to as the Czech Jorson, um, published uh, a version of Finet Sandron or Finet Cinders. So that's kind of, I track the first part of the tale um, that is more the Petit Pousse with the ogres. And this is the Cinderella part of the tale. Um, but it has a legacy, it goes to Nemkova. Um, and I'll come back to the Czech legacy. But I also find it interesting because we often assume the agency when it's the tales are written for children or po gain popularity, the agency of the heroine is toned down and it's just not true. That is not what I found at all in the book, um, working on the book. So here are 18th century prints. They loved depicting her, splashing her sisters with mud. There's even a 1931 version of her do, uh, doing that. Um, and I think it's important to note that it had a legacy that made it into the 20th century. So the Czech East German uh, production of Three Hazelnuts or Three Wishes for Cinderella um, draws from Bozema Nemkova's version of Finet Cinders. And I think people tend to work on the, the German influence or influence of the, the Grimm's tale because Nemkova has a version of Cinderella that's close to the Grimm's. Um, but I think when I looked at what the Czech scholars were saying, they emphasized more, especially like the agency. And I show in the chapter how much Finette Sandron is associated with horses and, and, and an active agency. So one Czech scholar I corresponded with was like, I'm definitely in one of his articles. He's like, I am definitely saying that this film draws from Don Was tale from Nimkova's version of Don Was tale. So that's kind of chapter one kind of looks follows the legacy as it relates to oral culture beauty beauty's beast and donois legacy i wanted to show that donois without donois we wouldn't have beauty and the beast but after beauty and the beast appeared donois tales that impacted the tale did not disappear um so uh what i so you know we have the genealogy of beauty and the beast tales where we go from apuleius Don Webb was very influenced by Cupid and Psyche. She writes The Ram, which is probably the closest literary tale we have to Beauty and the Beast before Villeneuve and the Prince de Beaumont. But the hero dies at the end and the heroine lives and rules as a queen. Um, so we can also see that Le Prince de Beaumont and Villeneuve are writing against Don Webb's ending, making it a happy ending. Um, she also wrote The Green Serpent, which had an impact. Um, uh, Aurora Wolfgang has written on Villeneuve's version of Beauty and the Beast and points out the places where Don Was' animal bride, bridegroom tale, The Green Serpent, also impacted Beauty and the Beast tales. And of course, then we have the canonical version by Le Prince de Beaumont. But after 15, 1754, Don Was' tales didn't disappear, Villeneuve's tale didn't disappear. Um, and one of the uh, the Ram, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Ram. I talk about the other tales, but it enjoyed a really lively legacy in Great Britain. Um, it, in, it had 28 editions. It appeared in Don Was Tales uh, in the 18th century. Let's see. And then um, and then in adaptations explicitly aimed at children, the it, it, it was interesting to see editions of the Ram, and in England it becomes Miranda and the Royal Ram. It, it takes on its own life in a way. Um, and in versions explicitly aimed at children, often they either have the pair both die at the end or both live, um, which I thought was really interesting because I guess the idea of a heroine whose lover dies and she becomes queen didn't sit well or doesn't, or they needed to fix that ending somehow. Um, so that was an interesting discovery that I made. And these are some images, uh, some prints of the tale. There's the ram who dies at the end of the tale. Um, and, and I just realized how widespread it was in England. So Daddy Ganger, Gander, which published a lot of Don Wolf's tales, not always attributed, um, 
has a version of Miranda and the Royal Ram. And in the text, it doesn't mention the fairy Ragat. And the fairy Ragat is the character who turns a pr the prince into the ram. So, so it's almost like it's in the air. People know the story uh, to be able to represent the fairy that isn't represented in the text. A, a better example of that was this clever anonymous poem, Miranda and the Royal Ram, which you wouldn't be able to appreciate if you did not know the tale. And it opens with a king who has a penchant for drink, a queen with a penchant for mutton, and she lectures her husband on temperance. Um, this household disorder leads them to forsake their parental duty to educate their daughter, the princess Miranda, who's beautiful but ignorant. She doesn't know how to read, and when a letter arrives, she goes to her, her evil aunt, who's a witch, and the aunt understands that it's a letter from Prince Fleecy, and the aunt realizes Prince Fleecy loves Miranda better than her own daughter. And, uh, and so she curses Miranda to become uh, a, 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 not a lamb, a lamb. Um, so she takes her wand and wanting to reform our guzzling king, turns him into a royal ram as she said, as the tale, as the, the text goes for sheep from getting tipsy shrink and very seldom want to drink. And then transforms Miranda, this vixen, into a lamb, hoping that her mother, who used to beat her, will now eat her with her penchant for mutton. And then a fairy appears, modifies the, the spell. Miranda must find a certain royal ram without horns, of no mother born, with black spots black and pale, and a very long tail, with a singular end, at first alone penned, but now in a fold, its back marked with gold. And after that, she can regain her original form. So it's interesting that the prince isn't turned into the lamb, but he has to name Prince Fleecy. So all of the humor resides in people being familiar with the tale. Um, and, and it's also a pun on the text itself because the royal ram has no horns. It's black and pale. It's ink and paper. It's a long tail, which can also be T-A-L-E, upon the prince note. It's penned. And then, uh, then in a fold, the poem is an eightfold book. Um, so that's so it's totally playing on the object, the book, the object of the book itself. With the help from the fairies, uh, the book the prince wanted was found, and Miranda, unlambed, will be locked in his arms when this volume is lettered and bound. Um, so I thought it was a very striking example that demonstrates the extent to which. Donwa's tale kind of took on a life of its own in England. Um, and uh, the Green Serpent, I won't talk about that part, but I, I also go into its legacy in France, um, culminating in Ravel, Maurice Ravel's use of the lamb and his mother goose sweet. So people often talk about the mother, it, you'll see it in encyclopedias, but realizing that the Green Serpent, a Donwa tale, was a, a really important part of that suite. Um, usually doesn't get discussed. So, so again, like my emphasis is always on legacy. Um, the white cat chapter three, the subject of chapter three is the white cat, and it's probably her most beloved tale and one of her most popular tales. Um, and I start with, you know, we have all these versions of Puss in Boots by Straparola. Uh, where a mother gives a son a female cat, we get to Basile, uh, a father gives a son a female cat, and then we have Perot, where uh, a father gives a son a male cat. And in all of those cases, the cat is the helper, right? He is below, he's kind of helping promote his master. Um, so Don Wa's title plays on all the cattails. She has different ways of inscribing cattails into her cattail. Uh, but rather than her cat playing the role of simple helper, her female cat is a sovereign of many kingdoms. She's very powerful. She helps the hero from above, from the position of patron or protectress, rather than from below, the, that is, the, the position of a servant. Um, so her female and sovereign cat presents important contrast to the cat tails by her male counterparts. Um, she also is going to incorporate elements from Charlotte de la Force's tale, uh, Percinette, and 
you know, just a side note, which I talk about in the chapter, La Force's tale was translated into German uh, by Frederick Schultz. Uh, and then the Grimm's took their version of Rapunzel from Schultz. And Schultz is really not an adaptation. If you compare the tales, they're very, very close. He makes some changes to vocabulary um, to anchor it in a Germanic culture versus a French or Italian a French culture. Um, but really, the Grimm's Rapunzel is very closely related to La Force's tale. And that serves as a backdrop of Don Wah's tale. So if, for people who don't know, I'll just give you the very short version of the tale. Um, a king sends his three sons on three quests, first for the tiniest dog, the second for the finest cloth in the world, and third, the most beautiful woman, who will, of course, be the white cat. During his first quest, the youngest of the three sons comes upon the marvelous palace of, of a white cat who is a sovereign there, and he's served by invisible hands. The white cat assists him on all three quests, uh, and, be, and at, during his third quest, he needs to cut off her head and her tail so that she can transform into a woman, which he does reluctantly. And after she transforms, she tells the prince her story, which is very much a Rapunzel tale. Uh, her mother had to give her up to the fairies in exchange for fruits to satisfy her pregnancy cravings, like Rapunzel's mother. Um, the princess is raised by the fairies in a tower. Uh, then she encounters a king. She's in the tower, she's this king. They fall in love with each other. They get married. But the fairies find out about it. They kill him with their dragon. The dragon just gobbles him up. And the princess, they wanted the princess to marry an ugly dwarf. She refuses. And the fairy condemns her to cat form until she finds a man exactly resembling her first husband, which is, of course, the youngest prince uh, of this king. Um, and then in the end, it's the princess who actually asks for the prince's hand. and. Um, Part of the rivalry between the three brothers is the king was going to give the winner uh, his kingdom. And the white cat is like, you know what? We don't need your kingdom. Keep it. And I'll give your sons a kingdom. So she's really the person in the position of power in the tale. Um, and again, I want to emphasize she was in power. She's a sovereign. And this was an incredibly popular tale in the 18th and 19th century through the 20th. Um, again, um, you can see the white cat was serialized in chromo form by Poudin Chocolate. And I have an, again, uh, article on how they, the, the use of Donois tales in chromos and other people, I think mostly Donois. And you can see the disembodied hands on the left side welcoming the prince into the castle. Uh, the white cat below, he's meeting her there. Um, there's the quest. You can see in the middle, um, and this was made for children, but they did represent her head cut off and bleeding at the bottom of the image. Uh, for boys and girls, boys were buying these too. So this is not a gendered reception of fairy tales. Um, and one thing that really surprised me, and I have to thank Jennifer Shacker for all of the work that she's done on pantomimes. Um, she kind of got me to realize the popularity of Don Noir through her her research and scholarship. And this is just the white cat, but I have on my blog debunking myths about fairy tales from 1811 till the end of the 19th century. There is an ad stage adaptation of a Donwa tale being performed pretty much every year. And James Robinson Flanchet is one of the most, he adapted, I believe, 12 of her fairy tales to the British stage. And he's not the only one, he might be the most prominent, but other uh, playwrights were also adapting her tales to the stage. So I talk a lot about the English adaptations. And just to give you a sense of these wonderful pantomimes, um, where the heroine doesn't lose her agency, as I argue, um, Planchet, uh, his, the king is the king once upon a time of never mind its namia. So they're very witty. Prince Paragon is going to be the main hero, and he's got a sidekick named Jingo. And then the white cat, we find out is Princess Katerina. And she has uh, and she has a maid, Palm Ira, who's a hand in the beginning. So uh, in this case, the king establishes a, contact, uh, a contest between his three sons. The Prince Paragon um, 
precious and placid to find a dog and the most beautiful princess. And here there's a stronger logic because we find out the three princes are triplets. Whereas in Don West's tale, the eldest should have inherited the kingdom, but the youngest does. And here, um, it's almost like it's more motivated. He has to put them to trial. And Planchet also invents the character of Jingo, who is quite funny, and he's afraid of cats at the beginning of the tale. So when they get to the the castle of the cats, it's, it's quite funny. Um, Planchet was very proud of the mechanics, the spectacle of the play. Um, he was able to, um, he talks about the very ingenious realization of the description in the story of the attendance of hands without bodies. They appeared in all parts of the stage, bearing flambeau, moving chairs, and executing various other orders in the most natural and graceful manner um, without the audience being able to tell how they did it. And then he plays a lot on the idea, Chingo declares, we've fallen into friendly hands when the hands welcome them in. Paragon quips, this show of hands is clearly in our favor. Um, Jingo ends up asking literally for a pair of hands in marriage. Uh, and then upon marrying the hands, he says, I've married nobody and would introduce her. And later on, when everyone transforms, um, he says, Jingo says, I've married someone after all. So um, they're very funny, uh, very witty. Um, in France, um, this was also a really popular adaptation was done by the Cognard brothers, and it was probably the most important fairy vaudeville uh, musical comedy in, in the 19th century. Um, Teresa was one of the sidekick characters that they created. She would have been the equivalent of an Edith Piaf in, in that period. So, you know, these were very popular shows. Um, in Le Monde Illustré, just to give you a sense of how people received this play, um, Charles Mont in 16, uh, 1869, he talks about a terrifying luxury. So all of those references to magical palaces, magical hands is really exploited in all of these stagings. And he, um, he says, you will tell me that there are always the same ballets, always the same decors, always the same nude women suspended in the air, always the same kings given to the same pleasantries, always the same fairies chanting the same spells with the same golden wand, always the same lily-livered squire, always the same demons leaping, leaping about. But what do you want me to say? It isn't always the same audience. Spectators replace other spectators. It's my son, it's yours who watch wide-eyed at those moments where I watched wide-eyed. So he's really speaking to this generational appreciation of this theatrical version of the white cat. And I think that's important. And in 1888, it is, this is the first photograph ever taken inside a building uh, in the history of photography. And it was an image of the white cat. Um, so just to, I think it's another way of showing the cultural importance of this, this play. Uh, it also made it to uh, Mexico in 1965, um, because these tales were circulating in Spanish between Spain and Mexico, uh, and this is the Mexican 1960s version of the white cat. Um, so I'm going to move to the last chapter, and then I, I want to have time for, for questions. The last chapter focuses on tales that we don't necessarily see continuing. Um, we have Mulan, but it's coming from a different tradition, and I, I call it the Lost Amazonian Warriors because these were tales that were popular, especially Don was, um, through, again, the 19th century. And I situate the rise of Amazon Amazonian warrior tales in a culture, in French culture, there's a whole iconographic tradition of strong women. Um, this is an image of Amazonian warriors in a card game published in 1644, intended initially for a young Louis XIV, but it became other, you know, it, it kind of spread. Uh, and um, so in the 1690s, Murat, L'Héritier, and Donois each produced a maiden warrior tale. There are Amazonian heroines who make appearances in other fairy tales, such as The Bee in the Orange Tree, the Beneficent Frog, and Villeneuve's version of Beauty and the Beast. Um, but I'm focusing on the tales where the maiden warrior is the main character. 
Um, and they all drew from Straparola and Basile. They were also very in, in, uh, inspired by recent events, by prominent icon, by this iconographical tradition. There was also the Fronde was the civil war in mid-century where aristocratic women dressed in armor and went and fought. And there's, I'll talk in a minute about another very specific reference to a woman who was a real Amazonian warrior. So we kind of had these three tales, The Wild Man by Murat, Marmoison by L'Héritier, and Belle Belle or The Night Fortuné. And as usual, Donois is the one who has the most important legacy. Um, I'm just gonna talk about, I'll skip Murat, but um, Marmoison was an interesting tale and uh, did make it to England. Um, so it's about a daughter, Leonor. She has a twin brother, Marmoison, who gets himself killed and she has to take his place to fight for the king. Uh, she proves to be the most valiant, he is the most valiant um, uh, knight at court, more worthy than her brother. Um, it has an interesting history because she's actually gonna dedicate the tale to Charles Perrault's, Charles Perrault's abused only daughter, L'Héritier was a relative of Perrault. And um, actually uh, Volker Schroeder has amazing archival evidence about these biographies. And um, he found a court case where Perrault's daughter went to court against him and his brother for abusive behavior um, just a few years after L'Héritier published Marmoison. So I, there's kind of that interesting backstory. And um, she republishes the story in 1717, giving it a different sort of frame and renames it the story of the French Amazon. Uh, and in that edition, she makes direct reference to Albert Barbe, uh, I'll just say Comtesse de saint um, who actually fought and uh, her actions during the Thirty Years' War were immortalized by Jean-Marie de Vernon, who published The Christian Amazon or The Adventures of Madame de saint -Badmont. And what I realized is that already in the earlier version of Marmoison, she takes a little inspiration from saint Badmont's story, but then makes that reference more explicit when she reframes the tale in 1717. Um, so this is an image that's from, uh, that's an image of saint Badmont. And in real life, uh, saint Badmont uh, protected women from rape when there were enemy soldiers. She protected, she got, she collected troops and protected the villagers from pillage. And those are two things that actually happen in, in L'Héritier's tale. So, um, so I found, I, I think Marmoison is just a fascinating tale with a, a, a really interesting history. Um, but Donoise Belle Belle is, is the one that has uh, this enduring legacy. Um, so again, her, like, along with her other tales, she, it, was, it was published with um, Mother Bunch tales. It again in England kind of takes its own life by being called the story of Fortunio. Uh, and, and you see that repeat, repeated again and again, taking a new life. Um, Benjamin Tabert published a standalone version in 1804, giving the king so the king doesn't have uh, a name in the tale. And now the king is going to be named Alfred. And that's going to persist in uh, the British adaptations. Um, not just book adaptations of the tale, but also stage adaptations. Um, when Planchet, he produces an extravaganza, Fortunio and his seven gifted servants in 1843, he uses Alfred as the name of the king. And then um, it also made it into a board game by William Spooner in 1846, um, probably due to the popularity of the extravaganza. Uh, so just to give you a sense, this is the board game. And if you look at the bottom right, so for people not familiar with the story, three sisters try to disguise themselves as a knight so they can fight on their father's behalf in, in war. The father either had to pay uh, a fine or send a son. And uh, the sisters that make it about Fortunio uh, makes it. And so Belle Belle. Uh, and then it kind of follows, so the board game follows the storyline if you if you go through. And here's some close-ups. Um, you can see on the bottom right, uh, I believe that's Fortunio succeeding with the, I, the fairy. 
um, you can see at the there's um, yeah there's a lot of colonial racial aspects to the board game that I talk about in the book. Um, but then you can also see in the top middle uh, image, it's very much like an apotheosis that you would see in a vaudeville or a fairy uh, musical comedy. So, so, so I think it's very much playing on um, the the what do I want to say the um, the tradition, the theatrical tradition of the tale. Um, so, and there again is the apotheosis scene. So even even the dress of the fairy is very much the ballet costume that you would see in the extravaganzas. Um, so uh, I'll stop there, and I guess we have lots of time for questions. But I guess one of the the main things I wanted to do, well, a few main things, is number one, show that these women writers from the 1690s had a legacy, a legacy in oral culture, a legacy in Czech Republic, a, Czech, a, a legacy in Germany, in France, in the United States, um, in Mexico, uh, and I also hope that the book is going to challenge sort of the stereotype that of the passive princess because I think what we often do is we project our fairy tale canon and our post Disney fairy tale canon onto the past and so there's this idea of the uh, eternal the eternal passive princess but when we go back and we look at Victorian England and 17th century France and early 19th century Germany, I think we actually had a more vibrant representation of female characters and, and also a more vibrant representation of women writers and storytellers. Um, so, uh, so I will stop there if I can figure out how to stop sharing. <laughs> and um, I'm happy to develop anything Let's see. Did I stop sharing? Can you see me? Yes, the the, yeah. the presentation is down now, Anne. So you you must have come off office so we can see you, and not the presentation. Okay, <laughs> I took the presentation down, but now I can't see you. What is going on? I'm in Microsoft Teams. What happened there? I'm glad you can see me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, this is very bizarre. Um, Microsoft Teams Classic. I, I can I can follow even if I can't. That is so bizarre, isn't it? You can still hear me. Yeah, and yes. we can see you. I don't know if you want to try going out and coming back in. I know that's high risk. Oh, it's probably fine. OK, you know what? I might do that. <laughs> um, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, and you can just let me right back in, right? Yeah, okay. so we'll, we'll, start, we'll start getting people to put their hands up with questions or put in questions in the chat. Sure, sounds good. OK. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why am I not? What is going on? Sorry. Right, so we got a hand up from Sue. Okay, I'll be right back. See you in a bit, hopefully. <laughs> right, so we got a hand up from Sue. And then. Um, and uh, and um, Misty, you asked for the link, and I've forgotten the I've forgotten the twenty percent off code. Did any, did anyone get that? It's Princess Twenty Four. Easy. All right. Thanks, I Jamie. You were paying attention. Chat as well. Yes, I was. <laughs> I love a discount, and also the topic of the talk. So it's great. Um, I'll let Anne back in. All right. <laughs> Hi, Anne. <Yay>! Up? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can see you. Oh, that was touch and go. All right, good. 
So, Paul, can I let you chair the questions? Sorry, yeah, not okay, let so you, I'm, but uh, ask uh, you. <laughs> Fantastic talk and thank you. I'm not sure what we do about applauses. I'm so out of practice with this type of thing. I don't know if you have to wave or whatever it is, but we'll do that at the end. So um, any questions, can you put your hands up? Um, Sue, your hands up, isn't it, straight away? So um, Sue, please um, start us off with your question for, for Anne. Thank you. OK, Can um, is the mic on? Yes. yes. OK, um, that was a great talk. Thanks ever so much. Uh, and towards the end, you made a, what was for me a very provocative statement about um, the, the the passive princesses, which which made me think again about Beckstein. So Beckstein has got lots of non-passive girls in his collection of Deutsche uh, das Deutsche Märchenbuch. And what what interests me, and and I haven't done any work on this, but I I'd, I'd love to see work done on it. In what areas? Are the heroines of Dolnois' tales and Beckstein's tales, respectively, uh, are they are they active or actually actively not passive? Um, are do they express their activity in the same kinds of areas, or are they different? I don't expect you to have an answer for this. It's right. it's just something that that occurred to me because the uh, collections are separated by more than a century and. Um, and, and it gives a chance for sociocultural aspects of the reception and expression of fairy tale material to emerge. That's that's my question. No, my statement. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, I mean, I do think because I can see like how, you know, Don Noir, versions are so aristocratic, you know. And then when you see like even let's say Ludovic von Hochhausen's adaptation, um, you might say the the extravagance, the you know it's like Don was writing in the context of you know Versailles been built, this kind of um, very a society based on spectacle, and I think a lot of that gets toned down in 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 the German versions, um, in um, and I think like. You know, when when we see the way they get adapted, you you might have uh, an active heroine, but they're all like in the Missouri version, I believe they're all they're peasants. They're not, you know, it was a miner who adapted Don Was Tale. I mean, who knows what happened? You know, it it probably filtered through um, through Quebec, you know, because I think the Missouri group had come had left Canada and gone down to Missouri. So over the years, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we've got this heroine. Um, it's interesting, too, because they might go to mass. In the Missouri version, she goes to a party. So everything is in French, but she goes to a party. You know. So I, th I think everyone, so I think a lot of times the, the active heroine is maintained to some degree or another, but then it changes form because of that socio economic, you know, is it a poor person telling the tale? Is it a rich person telling the tale? Middle class and all of that gets reflected in these in these adaptations. One thing that I think was really fun about the in France and England with the um, the fairy vaudevilles in France and the pantomimes and extravagances, they totally rip apart the class stuff in the original tales. So even when I talked about, you know, like um, the character who falls in love with the hands, you know, um, it's almost like the servants get reduced to hands in Don West's tale. And in the British uh, extravaganza, it's like her, the, the servant is, re, is, the hands are recognized as, as being something. They're not just there to serve, but you can fall in love with the hands. <laughs> so, and I, so there's a lot of class play in all of those staged versions, which, also makes sense because they think they attracted a broad spectrum of people in the in the public. Head your hands up. Yes. Yeah, so, um. Um. So we're saying that there used to be more active princess heroines. Do we blame someone specific? Is it Walt Disney's fault? Is it the Brothers Grimm? Or is it something broader and societal? I mean, I think I think it's 
complicated. I think, I do think Disney had a big impact. And this is maybe going to sound problematic, but it was something I was thinking about. Um, and I, I want to start off by saying I'm a total feminist scholar and everything. But, it, but I think like we had these generations of feminist writers responding to what happened post Disney with the narrowing of the scope of what a heroine is. And I mean, in some ways it goes back to the Lurie, uh, the debates, um, who am I thinking, who, who is it again? I'm forgetting the debate. In the, anyway, I, th I think we have, so then in our scholarship, we want to analyze Angela Carter did important things and all of these other feminist writers did important things by rewriting the past of princess. But then it, that it becomes almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy where we forget that this wasn't always the canon. This wasn't always the literary field. And then it gets protected back. So, so I mean, I think, of course, all of these feminist writers should have should have rewritten these tales and, and they're wonderful. And I love Angela Carter. But then I think I think we kind of accept as natural, like what we what is our concept of the fairy tale and what we're reacting to and not realizing that, you know, it's just a little tiny piece of the puzzle. And then when we go back, it's hard. I think there's also a prejudice against earlier periods. So I'm I'm trained as an early modernist. I work in France, where tons of women writers were writing, and nobody knows that. Uh, and and we also, I'm teaching a class now on feminist thought from Christine de Pizan de Simone de Beauvoir. And there were male feminists in the 17th century, but people don't always accept that. It's easier to say, oh, yes, of course, the princesses were passive. I think even when people started reading Don West tales, it was like, well, she can't really be a feminist because you know, feminists didn't really exist. Or I've had many debates with people and it's sort of been one of my pet peeves. And I, I actually wrote two articles after my first book because I'm like, no, please listen. Um, where people are like, well, Charles Perrault, you know, that was the best that what a man could do in the 17th century to defend women, you know? And it's like, no, it's simply not true. There were other male writers who were very explicit and their support and there's actually, um, uh, I taught this semester François Poulain de la Barre, who wrote a text on the equality of the, the sexes in the 1670s. So, um, so there have always been feminist men. So I think it's like a, it's like a combination of reacting to our own immediate fairy tale canon on the one hand, but also our lack of confidence in the past or our lack of knowledge, I should say, that that there's. The, the past is more com uh, complicated than, than one would think. Thank you. I know someone mentioned editions, and if you read French, this by Barchillon and uh, Philippe Urquard is, I would say, a really good edition. And what I would say in French is that someone really needs to do a critical edition. There's like, you know, scraps. I, I would say that Planchet's edition isn't terrible, you know, that he's really the only one who's translated all of her tales. Um, and uh, it's, um, but I, I do think that it's time for someone to do a contemporary critical translation. So there isn't a translation that you would recommend at the moment? I could recommend several. Um, and now I'm, um, there is there, there's been some recent ones not not um i can send you i can can i send heather some recommendations because there's a couple uh there's a couple there's a new one i'm forgetting the titles i'm really bad with with names <laughs> and titles but i can send it to you yes did paul have a question misty's hand was up before mine so okay. misty please thank you Can we? Misty, you were a question, your hands up. Maybe the mic's still on. Here, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. 
Okay, yay! So um, I told my camera to be on. If you can't see me, I'm not really sure what's glitching. But anyway, the mic's working. So, um, so you, you noted a number of uh, literary references and cultural references in the 1600s and 1700s showing these supports of, you know, women's rights and women's situations from both male and female writers in France. Do, is there, if, are there, have you come across similar texts or in um, English or in Britain or finding those French texts translated into English in Britain or did, was this sort of a um, cultural experience that was more or less um, singular to France at the time? Are you talking about the, the general feminist text? Yes. Uh, you know, and I guess I can't speak with a lot of authority about early modern England. Um, I know that um, some of these texts were translated. Uh, a lot of, as, as many people have said, even regarding the fairy tales, um, people would have known French, educated people would have been able mm -hmm. to read a lot of this in French. Um, I know that some of those ideas would definitely be there. I don't know if you know Mary Estelle's work. She was a 17th century British feminist. Um, there's also Margaret Cavendish, uh, who was corresponding with Descartes and was probably, so there is kind of a network of European women writers as well. Um, so I don't think these ideas would have been completely foreign. I know that Madeleine de Scudery has um, a feminist text from 1642 called The Illustrious Women, and that was translated into English. I'm not sure. And I also learned from one of my students this semester, like going back to the early, fifth, early 15th century, Christina Pizan's City of Ladies was actually translated into English in the 16th century and was more popular in England than in France. So so I don't, I don't think, that, I think some of these ideas, there might have been a stronger culture in France because of the salons, the French salons mm -hmm. that really were empowering. So they kind of had yeah. this social structure, but it certainly wasn't absent from England or um, like the Netherlands. I know there's uh, Sweden, you know, Germany. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sure. There's, there's an early, um, Rachel Spate is certainly in, in England in 1614, I think she takes on Swetnam in uh, Biblical Exegesis as to um, whose fault the fall is, so there are earlier examples of that, and then if you track, there's debates around marriage in the late 17th century, and then obviously going into the, the uh, revolutionary period, you've got the group around um, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, to pick up about the stage adaptations of Dalwa in pantomime tradition, is her name still attached to these translations or has, has her name become detached from these adaptations? Um, kind of, I need, I feel like Planchet is aware and I can't remember if he, because he translates Stonewa after he does all these adaptations. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, she, she's known in England under many different names, Mother Bunch. So sometimes there'll be like a play based on the tales of Mother Bunch or uh, so, so that, so there is, or Queen Mab tales because they were often produced. So I would say it was mixed. Um, I, I do think sometimes it was attributed, I think in the French, in the Konya, the white cat, it wasn't attributed to her. Um, but I do think her name was probably much more well known than we would think. I mean, you, there are several British translations. Um, I'm trying to, Anne Thackeray Ritchie um, does the preface to one of the translations. Planchet had a very popular translation of her tales. So I think they're kind of known both under her name, but as Mother Bunch tales as well. So kind of a mix, I would say a mix. I don't know if that makes sense. But people knew like for instance, the white cat. I mean, I guess as much as people might know, you know, in, in the United States, people might know Puss in Boots or Cinderella, but they won't necessarily know it's Perot, even if it's published as Perot's Tales. But so it's kind of like that. It's sort of an in between. Thank you, um, Sue. Your hand was up next, and then and then Jamie. 
Yeah. Uh, on the subject of, of publications and republications, uh, first England and then uh, on the on the continent. Uh, some years ago, uh, when I was doing some work on Donois, I was fascinated to find that her tales were a, a, a collection of her tales were translated uh, quite soon after she'd published them in, in French into English for uh, quite obviously the upper for upper class readers because of the of the vocabulary and the reference points within the tales. Then they then there was a follow up. Uh, it was it was not a retranslation, but I think an editing of the first for the upper classes written book for for wealthy merchants or merchant class, not aristocracy. Mm -hmm. And subsequently that was edited for um, a, a much simpler readership. And only the, after that did the first translation meant for children uh, in England uh, come about, and that was around 1750. So there were several iterations before before she actually you know, reached, uh, not that she was trying to reach, but anyway, before the, the book, uh, became targeted uh, at a child readership. Now, the second thing I uh, and, is and Sue, I just I have I have to thank you because I did I did um, you did a lot of great research on on those British editions, which was super helpful and I think really really important. <laughs> Thanks. Um, th then I had a question about pirated editions. Uh, Perrault was very, very much pirated, especially um, in in uh, in Holland, in the Netherlands, and and it seems that some of the, or many actually of the of the further afield translations came from were based on the Dutch uh, pirated editions rather than on Perrault's original French edition. Um, and I wondered, I've actually never looked into what what happened with the further French uh, publications of Dolnois, that is to the, ex the extent to which that they might have been pirated in, in, um, in Dutch editions, and the extent to which they went to, I, I don't know whether to call them down market or out market, uh, situations, presses in southern France, other, in other parts of France. Did you come across anything like that in your work? I mean, I, I wasn't, I didn't, I know there's editions that are getting published in Amsterdam, um, but I guess I'll start off by saying no. <laughs> um, I know that, you know, in the in the chat books, the, the Bibliothèque Bleu de Trois, her books tended, she, she, actually her books were circulating in chapbook form um, more than Perrault's tales. So there were more chapbook editions, I believe, of, uh, of Donois, but I'm not sure about those pirated editions. Yeah, okay, thanks. Sure. Jamie, your hand was up, is it still up? Um, it depends, Heather, are we out of time? I think people who need to leave are leaving. So if, we, if we're still here, we can listen to your question. And I just wanted to put the 20 percent off thing in the in the in the chat in case anyone wants it. So um, but yes, I'm 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 OK if you're OK. <laughs> um, my question may be slightly out of left field and a weird one to end on. But um, for the people who don't know, I'm currently a theology student who is also very interested in stories and myth and, and fairy tales. Um, have you kind of tangentially found a link between the religiosity of this period and the pacification? That's not a word, but it is now of the the female heroines. Just something I'm curious about. I mean, I think I'm not sure how much it has to. I mean, you could say, let's say Perot is definitely much more religious than a, a lot of the women writers were, and 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 so I think it does. I think in his case, like. Um, you know, he was reading Tertullian, who has a terrible text on women in clothes, and I think, and and Perot translated that. Um, but I think when you look at the bigger picture, I think uh, 
I, th I think like you have a distinction between pre and post French Revolution in France, at least, where post revolution France, you have a reaction against this independent aristocratic women and the proper. So there's actually much more a stronger discourse about female domesticity later. At the same time that Don Was tales were still being published in France, like I, I did an article on um, the Grimm's and when did they take a foothold in France? And it's really not until the very end of the century where they were not looked at as scholars, but as fairy tale writers, you know? And then especially after Disney Snow White, then you have the first French edition of Blanche Neige, uh, Snow White in, but there were no independent, independently, individually published books of individual tales by the Grimm's, maybe not until Snow White. Uh, whereas Don Wash, she was being published, uh, and and I've looked at a lot of those translations, and they're not I, they're not um, fudged with a whole lot. <laughs> they're they're pretty much maintained. Even even in the versions targeted at children, they might tone down the sex, they might tone down, but they usually don't eliminate the female agency in ways we might think it would. So even despite those bigger cultural changes. Um, there were still these really active heroines being circul circulating in the 19th century. That is really helpful. Thank you. Are there any more questions out there in the ether while Anne is here? <clears throat> um. Anything else? Sue, are you? Yes, I, I thought as you moved to the camera that you had another question. Sue, please, thank you. Uh, this, this is really a response to uh, James Hardman's uh, question about religiosity. Uh, you might like to look at a book by Ivan Loskutov, which right. treats. Uh, yeah, why, why don't you go on, Anne? Because no, I can't go remember. Ahead. Right I, now. I, I can't remember the title either. <laughs> but it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he t he talks about the the need. Th this had not not very much to do with. Uh, it wasn't directed at at fairy tales, but in religious terms, it had to do with adults uh, becoming like a child again. This was this was a period of the, of the cult of Jesus, the infant Jesus, uh, the the 1680s and 90s. And Loskutov uh, believes that this uh, had an effect on the. Um, way in which fairy tales were were composed by Perrault and and I think I, I think there's an awful lot to the arg argument and it's worth reading through because it touches on a bro broad variety of writings in in this period wouldn't you say Anne? You know I haven't looked at that book in so long um I also because I, I also I guess I think of um Christine Jones's work on the bagatelle, like this idea of, you know, kind of the women playing on um, kind of, well, this is just fri frivolous and, and playing on that idea of frivolity at the same time that they might be criticizing the king or criticizing arranged marriage or criticizing gender norms. Um, so I have looked at Ivan Luskut, whatever his name is, <laughs> uh, a long time ago. Um, and I, I, I think it's maybe there in the background, but I think that there's so much so much playful stuff going on and mixing of adult and, you know, kind of frivolous themes to, I don't know if that made any sense. Um, Sue, so if you could type that name in the chat because it's, it's bewildered me. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, you've had your hand up. Was that for the title of the book, or was there another question as well? Yeah, sorry, I tried to I tried to spell the name of the book and um, had an aneurysm. So could someone type it in, please? Because I really I can't. Google doesn't even know what I'm trying. I was to I was so I was I also yeah. very struggling. So thank you, I appreciate oh, that. Thank you very much. But I do <laughs> definitely want. Miss, your hand is up. Uh. Peter, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I had I had a question for you, Anne. So this um, interest in the strong female heroines and the uh, female fairy tale writers' legacy. Did you grow up hearing or reading some of these stories, or was it sort of a void 
that you went looking to fill as you became older? I mean, it was probably a void at the same time that, you know, I, I think we can criticize the Grimm's, but I think when you actually read Tales by Grimm's and Anderson and not the Disneyfied versions, I don't think I grew up as, what would you say, um, imbo- with, with as strong an idea of, of the passive princess, because I guess I didn't grow up with VHSs where I could watch Disney films all over and over and over again. So I think it was there. I feel like I also grew up in the 80s, which was very androgynous. <laughs> but I did appreciate like Alien, you know, seeing um, Sigourney Weaver playing a role like that. Um, so, uh, but but I, I think like I just was, I, I think part of it is also my interest in the past. And, and the assumptions we make that women only started thinking about being equal. And, and I guess I was looking at my own family where I have, I can see how generations formed my grandma generation during the depression where they needed to be economically um, engaged in the household or people couldn't feed themselves. So they were stronger. And then you, you know, kind of understanding that, that different historical periods shape women's subjectivity differently and realizing how um, how Disney actually had a huge impact on ideas of the passive princess. I mean, maybe I had a mixed idea, but I think as I as I studied fairy tales and realized like the reception by the general public of fairy, fairy tales, and especially younger generations who who really grew up with Disney, that's their reference. I watch the Disney, and I'm just like, but they're so passive. <laughs> so it's kind of a yeah, I don't know how, yeah, I guess it's a mix of things that got me interested in it, if that made sense. Thank you. I was, I, uh, uh, your quest to change, to challenge the myth of fairy tales, I sort of completely concur. I, <laughs> I, I was raised by my German grandmother, who was from the same regions as the Brothers Grimm, and I heard the stories where there were strong female characters. So this, this, when I mm. became an adult and started getting more in fairy tales, like coming at this perception of like, oh, the women are all passive. And I'm like, you weren't hearing the same stories that I did. So it was sort of interesting to hear your journey to get to where um, you are. I think there is a debt to Disney just for helping create a national awareness of the fairy tales and help popularize them. But I, I do think it should be a springboard and not an end point. Right. Right. But, so I, so I appreciate and applaud the work that you're doing <laughs> in, in your writing. So thank you very much for all of your um, insight today. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Christine, your hand has, has shot up there. Uh, if it's not too late, no, I, okay. Anna, you have right. to okay. I'm good. Thank you, Anne, for a lovely talk. And I have your book and I'm reading it, so it's great. Um, I uh, <clears throat> have a couple of comments and a question. Uh, so I really like the way, you know, you're, you're looking at fairy tales in history and uh, really trying to expand our notion there of um, how fairy tales have uh, by women and about uh, active women have been um, circulating at different times. So we can't just talk about progress, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so along those lines, I just wanted to say about Angela Carter that, you know, if we think about her in history, she was not really considered a feminist at the time. She right. was extremely controversial um, among feminists. Now we look at her you know, and think of her as feminist. And she was really interested in the past, but more of folk tales than fairy tales. So right. we do have her anthology. Uh, I forget now what it's called, maybe the Virago um, Book of Fairy Tales, that does present a lot of active and subversive and, um, you know, strong uh, female characters. So right. that was just a little comment there. And 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 uh, um, I I belong to the generation, I was born in 1955, um, that, uh, well, I read 
the Golden Book of Fairy Tales. And that included Dol Noir tales and other tales from um, countries, including um, uh, Scandinavian countries and so on. And uh, that was really like a formative experience for me and for um, several, I, I mean, a, a, a large number, I think, of um, uh, women, girls and women, um, especially in the US. I was not in the US, but I was reading this in English. Uh, so Donois legacy and, and the other women's legacy really continued. Uh, but maybe was interrupted, right, at different times and so right. on and so forth. So, sorry to go on and on. My question is about the chromos because I think it's so interesting what you have to say, uh, what you what you um, unearthed about the ways in which these fairy tales were used in uh, um, publicizing these um, large businesses, department stores. So can you talk a little bit about that? And how? why do you think they went to the women's stories in particular? I mean, they did have Perot, so I just, um, but I think this is where Dal Noir, I guess they focus on Dal Noir because Perot's there, but I think Dal Noir might be represented more than Perot in some of these chromos. So I don't want to say Perot wasn't, but they were, Donois tales are at least as if not more popular than Perot. So, uh, but I do think, and, and I also, Donois tales, I think these were intended for both boys and girls. And you can even see the way they, um, there's like a, uh, the beauty with the golden hair, where if you read the tale, it's a more mature tale, but then they, in the chromos, they almost um, reshape it so it could appeal to boys. So they can identify with the hero. Um, I think uh, the idea of associating departments, or I think there's almost that magical industrial revolution fairy tale that they could use the fairy tales to say, you know, the magic of now everyone can eat chocolate or the magic of the department store. Um, I mean, I think they were also, it was a very clear marketing scheme to get people to come back. And this is the, some of the earliest examples of, of, um, uh, of of marketing things that people didn't really need, right? <laughs> so, um, so I think it was a strategy, and I think a strategy. Uh, I think I think my brain is. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm answering your question, Christina, about the about the chromos, but um, it is really fascinating how it it it's like you have desire for more story, gets intertwined with desire for chocolate. And I think there's also, like with the supermarket, with the Obo Marche, this identification with the luxury that you see in the fairy tale, and you're going to become the fairy princess if you go shopping at Le Bon Marche. You're the so I think there's a lot of identifying. You can be, you can live your own fairy tale by coming to our department store, or you're going to eat chocolate like an aristocrat by eating these uh, chocolate bars that needed to be incited because chocolate bars in, this is again, we had to invent the need for chocolate bars. And so they needed a whole marketing campaign to make them appealing in the late 19th century. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there's that because chocolate was also associated either with medicinal purposes or the upper class. And so eating a chocolate bar, you know, being attached to the fairy tale makes it more aristocratic. So there's definitely that, that part of it. Well, I think um, we've made Anne work hard enough now for <laughs> an answer session. Um, so I think we best um, bring proceedings to a close. Um, I'd like to thank Anne again for a, a really wonderful talk, really thought provoking. Um, make us all go off and look for proper editions of Dalwar, put pressure on publishers to actually publish proper edition of Dalwar so we can all go and read it and see, um, see fairy tales before they become kind of pared down to very simple texts and the same five or six stories being repeated. Like that's probably part of Darwin's problem is that the big tales aren't there or they're kind of concealed with much longer text. Um, so without further ado, I think we should thank Anne however we want to do it, wave hands or 
clap and then some people it's breakfast time other people it's lunch time <laughs> and Doctor Who somewhere else the tea's getting cold so uh, thank you once again and as Heather said this will be going up on the Centre's YouTube um, channel there's some other bits on there now there's more bits going up there um, we've got another talk in April on St George's Day I think isn't it Heather isn't it um, Rosamund Kerwin is talking about Celtic tales so the invite will go out for that so we hope um, people come and, and join us there so thank you to Anne thank you to everyone who asked questions thank you all of you for coming thanks to Heather for putting this together as always and um, yeah hopefully I'll see you all soon um, either in person or on the screen obviously if you're in Australia you're not going to come for our midsummer event if it gets up and running but we'll see you all soon and um, I hope you enjoyed it thank you Anne <laughs> And thank you all so much for listening. And thank you, Heather and Paul, for, for having me. So this was awesome. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. All right. Everybody Thanks. there. See you all next time. Yes. À la prochaine. <laughs> <laughs>